So welcome to the fourth in our series, right? Um, of um, XR in the digital arts and humanities. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about advanced media. You'd think with all of this width, I'd be able to get out of the way of the title. Um, uh, today, uh, Matt Mercer um, will be presenting as will I and Chris Eller. Um, and then I think, okay, this is gonna work, right? No, let me do it. <sighs> <laughs> I swiped that for those of you um, listening at home, um, and it made me really happy, clearly, <laughs> to have that ability. So there will also be um, a presentation you can see on IQ Walls on October 17th. It will be in here, and this new IQ Wall is touch-enabled, which means you, too, can swipe, which is... Swipe left, right? Is that good? Is that the good direction? Swipe right is the good direction. Swipe right. <laughs> so when it comes to IQ walls, swipe right. Um, so uh, as you can see, though, we're going to have next week is on 3D digitization. It's just going to be Jeff Rogers. I'll be presenting elsewhere, but Jeff is great. Um, and then we'll have an expedition um, on October 3rd with Jeff and I. Um, October 10th, we'll have um, 3D digitization for cultural heritage with Albert William, um, who has gone to Greece and done all of these Greek Orthodox churches, um, and it's really, really cool. Um, and then, like I said, on the 17th, Chris and I will talk about IQ walls, then we'll have an expedition on the 24th. Then the 31st, we have no talk, because you know we want you to enjoy Halloween and I guess spring or fall break. Um, on November 7th, Chauncey and I will be talking about augmented reality. Then we'll have an augmented reality expedition. Um, and then finally, we're gonna have a really amazing, what I think is the best of our, our great, uh, of our guest talks um, from Juliet Graver Istrabadi from the Eskenazi, Michael Chabin and John Rasek, who have both received um, bicentennial funding to do sort of invisible IU. Um, so we'll get to hear a lot about the kinds of innovative stuff that they're doing. Can I swipe and not drop my crutch? That's the question. Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk briefly about 3D digitization and the humanities. Um, and we what decided to bookend this presentation with information about Hoagie Carmichael. Um, so this is um, an example of a 3D capture of the statue that is currently about 400 feet to our south. Um, and um, captures of these objects can be studied in classrooms more interactively, and they can be things from shipwrecks to frescoes to churches, frescoes and churches to statues. Um, this is Hoki Carmichael at his piano, and it was digitized via photogrammetry, um, which is the taking of many, many, many pictures um, to generate geometry and texture that can be viewed and studied virtually. So if you look at the the first picture up here, there's actually many, many, many polygons making this up, little triangles. Um, and then the second one is actually the, the, oh, I touched it. Oh, you guys, I touched it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there, I did it. But then can I do this? Will it, no. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, no. But More like blank. Okay. We will go over. Somebody move my cheese. There it is. Okay. Um. So this is. Oh, it's, it's okay. It'll be the fine. Um. So this is Hoagie Carmichael, as he exists on Sketchfab in all his 3D greatness. Um. So yeah. So these are the two of the other um, methodologies that I talked about. This is the Enriquillo um, shipwreck, um, which is also um, the USS Stallion. Um, and you can see that this is actually offshore in the Florida Keys. And, um, and then for those of us who will never scuba dive, like this is a great way to be able to interact with something like this. Um, and we heard a really interesting talk about it last week from the underwater science folks. And then this is the um, Arena Chapel or Scolvigny, um, which is in Italy. And this was actually tested in an art history classroom with all of these annotations. But um, if you, will you bring that one up for me on Sketchfab? Yeah. 
Um, so if you're normally, I mean, it's kind of got, it's got multiple things. If you're studying a fresco cycle um, in an art history book, you're literally only going to be able to have the one vantage point that's printed in the book. Um, here, you can get these additional vantage points. Now, if you want to see it in situ and you travel all the way to Italy, this is halfway up a wall. So again, you're now limited by your ability to be a human being, right, and how tall you are. Um, and so when you put this into virtual reality goggles or you study it this way, you can now sort of see all the fresco cycle in relation to each other um, and the annotations. And you can also jump up so that you're now 100 feet up the side of the church. So that's really cool. Escape. Yes. No. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to my fellow um, GIMP, <laughs> who is now going to get his, <laughs> his crutches because he knows I'll yell at him if he doesn't. So I'm going to yell at you. I just want to point out these presentations are accessible. <laughs> it's right here. All right. So a lot of things that I've worked on when it comes to advanced media is three, 360 degree capture. So that would include working on a or taking pictures to get like the immerse yourself within a scene that you might have created or a different space that you might want to see. And so what a 360 degree tour is, is bringing together all those 360 degree captures and creating kind of like a simulation of each location within this tour. Also, for some of the softwares that you use for these tours, you can, you're able to add audio, text, video, and even some more static photos within each photosphere. And you can view these tours on computers, phones, and HMD devices, virtual reality devices. Oh, there you go. So some of the uses of a 360 degree tour are academic research and education. Maybe you're showing it to a class and expressing or trying to show something that you wanted you want them to be immersed in historic preservation prototyping tourism real estate and marketing and things to consider when creating a 360 degree tour is who is this going to be for who's who's the audience and why is it important to them or why is it significant to them what is the message that you are trying to convey and then you start to brainstorm and plan what locations you want to take capture in this 360 degree tour. And lastly, you have to consider, is it gonna be outdoors? Is it gonna be indoors or is it gonna be both because of maybe things and differences in lighting or being uh, blocked by walls or just people walking by that could be in front of the lenses when you're taking these pictures. One of the 360 degree tours that I've created is the Campus Limestone Tour, which was a virtual representation of Indiana, the Indiana Geological and Water Survey's Indiana University Campus Limestone Tour. And the purpose of this tour was to display a beautiful, the beautiful architecture, the beautiful mostly limestone architecture on the campus of Indiana University Bloomington. For a lot of people there might just not be able to make it to the actual tour. And when I was taking capturing these photospheres, I used an Insta360 Pro camera, which is basically a six lens camera that goes all around and looks like a ball and allows you to have the options of maybe having a monoscopic, monoscopic capture or a stereoscopic capture and it can be in 4K or 8K resolution. And when I was putting these capt these photospheres within a, uh, in a tour software, I decided to use Google Tour Creator, 
which is free with a Google account, and it's easy to use. It's very simple. And I was able to present this tour on November 20, in November 2018 at the Geological Society of America annual meeting in Indianapolis to kind of display how you can bring together virtual, tour, virtual tourism and education. Now, I kind of like want to show the campus limestone tour to show what it's all about. Yeah, there's a full screen on the top, right? If it's able to, I'm able to uh, move it. Oh, it's over there. I gotta go walk all the way. I can move it over. Ow. Actually, can you press this key? sample gates. All right, so one of the captures that I did on this campus limestone tour was sample gates. And with the help of the Indiana Geological and Water Survey, they actually sent me some extra insets or images, audio, videos, whatever they wanted, or text that would kind of add to the story of this tour. And so some of the things were maybe the plaques that you couldn't see on this tour. Ooh. That were on the sample gates, like, like this plaque right here that shows that it's who it's honoring, whose sample. And on the other side, kind of a message for you walking into campus, because this is kind of the I guess you could say the entrance of Bloomington's campus. And I found that really cool that we were able to add these extra things within this virtual tour. So you're able to look around and actually kind of be interactive with the tour as you're going with it. And then one more thing that I thought was pretty cool, which I, I thought of just while I was capturing these things was being able to add audio and actually making you feel like you're truly immersed within the uh, within the tour. No, it clicks with the, uh, it kind of plays. It's like an autoplay. Do you know if you can click on that corner right there? All right. Yeah. 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 Oh, I hear it. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I hear it. <laughs> and so I decided as I was capturing, since the bell tower is pretty iconic for this campus, I wanted to add the sound of each, what is it, 15 minutes for the, every 15 minutes when it starts chiming. And I think that's really cool when I'm on campus and I'm just going to class. That's something that's really special about IU. And so another tour that I worked on And probably mute. You can just mute that. And so another tour that I've been working on recently was kind of a virtual tour of the Hoagie Carmichael room in the lowest level of the Morrison Hall. And I decided to use, or they, they actually came to us and they were kind of excited about using of having a virtual tour of the room. And we decided to use the Matterport Pro 2 camera, which is kind of the mix of a 360 camera and a, like, I would say infrared scanner, 3D scanner. And about this room, it's kind of a memorial for Hoagie Carmichael, who is a famous Indiana songwriter and performing artist and from Bloomington and went to IU. <laughs> so 
he actually his family sent donated a lot of this uh the collections and memorabilia to this room and what the matterport pro 2 camera allows is you to not just have the photospheres but also having that fully immersive 3d representation of the space being captured and kind of creating like a 3d mesh of the space and being able to see it in like a floor kind of a floor plan and a, uh, a dollhouse kind of view. And this tour is gonna to be presented at the Bicentennial Showcase on September 27th. And I kinda of wanna show that as well, cause this is super cool. And so I like, we actually uh, made a change today to have it actually starting where you would be walking in if you were actually in the Hoagie Carmichael room. And you're able to just kind of these circles show where I placed this camera for each uh, capture and being able to scan. And we were able to add some annotations of it showing links and being able to see pictures as well. And then also being able to actually play music. If I can back off from this. <laughs> yeah. I can look so. <laughs> yeah. Aww. And then also being able to play, I can just stay right here, and then being able to play music through the uh, app, but only being able to use SoundCloud for this, for the music and audio. But I honestly thought that was a pretty cool thing that they were able to add to this, having the audio, having the, having that text, being able to, you're even able to have a playlist, a SoundCloud playlist on this Matterport scan. And I thought that was really awesome. So I, I believe the Matterport's a far more complex camera, but the results are awesome. They're really cool. And then, ooh. yeah, good screen grab of it. And then I pass it to Tassie. Right, so uh, finally, uh, we'll have more discussion. So if there are any questions or anything from people online, we'll be looking for those. Uh, but coming up shortly, oh, we have a question. Yes, I have a Okay, so excellent question from in the room. I'll repeat it. Uh, There's a question about copyright and, and um, protections for intellectual property of the objects, uh, the, the scenes, the locations, anything that might be iconic or sort of owned by, by the creator or other rights holders. Uh, so I think Tassie came up here because she was going to mention uh, talk about that. I don't know what the answer is, <laughs> so we'll hand it to Tassie for that one. 
Um, so yes, there are. And so one of the things actually, we have a project planning document and one of the things we ask is whether or not people have the rights to what they're about to display. Um, so for things like the Hokie Carmichael Room, um, since it's located at Indiana University and all of the objects are owned by Indiana University, I think there all the rights are pretty clear. Um, but actually when um, the, another project that we recently did with the Lilly Library, just because the object is part of their collection actually doesn't mean that they have the rights to it. Um, there are times when the estate still maintains the right to the object and we had to write to the estate and ask for permission, even though a 3D version is often considered a derivative, um, to put that derivative online. So that's a really, that's a really great question. Um, I think one of the most famous examples of a space you can't just capture and put up is the gridiron building, right? Um, it is patented and flat iron. I knew it had the word iron in it. Um, so yeah, it's something you certainly have to be aware of, um, especially in the cultural heritage arena, um, that uh, intellectual property is something that people, there's, um, the, the, there's a book I'm working on uh, with a bunch of other people from CS3DP and there is a whole IP section um, from people who are copyright librarians. <laughs> And these sorts of copyright questions really come into play uh, with the, this idea that once the data has been acquired, it can then be reproduced in some form, especially now that we have uh, 3D printers, which are capable of, uh, you know, not an exact replica and, so, and sometimes not in the same medium that an original piece may have been executed in, but you could still create a, a, a derivative reproduction of something which really probably should be unique. So there's there's careful considerations there with today's technology, but of course the focus in cyber infrastructure for digital humanities and the advanced visualization lab is not for reproduction, it's for preservation and study, which is something that you know the university is definitely uh, uh, a promulgator of, of learning from these things. And sometimes there's only one of an object and it's not even here but if we have a digitized data set of that object, it can be studied, uh, you know, in, in, without having to actually hold the object or be with the object right there. Yeah, I wanted to talk about actually one of our upcoming Matterport captures is um, the Lilly Library is closing for renovations. Um, and so we're gonna capture it as it exists now. And then we're gonna go back in in 18 months and catch, capture it um, in its newest version. And then people will be able to see both. Um, with the Hoagie Carmichael Room, one of the great um, things behind this capture is it's a limited access room. Um, I don't know exactly what the rules are that let, you know the special sauces that gets you in there, but it isn't a room that you know you can just walk into um, every time of the every time of the day. Um, and then, as we showed with like the shipwrecks and other things, that these are getting you to things that maybe you'll never learn how to scuba dive. Um, that they're giving you access to things you might not normally have access to. Um, so we really want to think about what that looks like, how it can facilitate learning and pedagogy, um, and then research also putting things side by side that have never existed together in geographical um, space. Yes, sir. What may be some other uses of the tour other than it has to have access to something that um, you don't have access to normally, like, um, for instance, uh, for memory um, uh, recognition or uh, neural stimulation? Oh, so the question was, what are other, what are other uses of a tour other than um, for providing access to those who might not be somewhere, perhaps from memory or neural recognition? So one of the members of the AVL is recreating his, um, his childhood home, which they recently had to sell. Um, and so, and then he's going to populate it with, um, with things that, with uh, family memorabilia, which he also owns, so that now the insets will be, anybody can go back to their childhood home at any time. Um, and sort of, and they can they can walk through it and visit it. And I know as someone who, um, I didn't know that people's grandparents lived in normal houses. Um, my grandfather built my grandmother a Swiss chalet off grid. Um, and so I thought that grandparents lived in magical fairy tale houses <laughs> until I was 19. Um, and uh, and uh, in, on 40,000 acres in the Colorado, Colorado wilderness, but when they sold it, when they became older and, and not able to sort of live off the grid, 
um, I know that I would give anything to sort of go back to that space. So I think you're right, this ability to like revisit things in our past. Um, another great example that speaks to sort of some of what happened, um, you know, we know about a year ago that the museum in Brazil went up in flames and they lost 90% of their collection. Um, we also, I mean, Notre Dame was another example um, just much more recently. Um, even though there is a full laser scan of Notre Dame, should they wish to reconstruct it exactly as it was, we know that it won't be the same, right? Um, it won't date to the same time. And then the other famous example is the Palmyran Arch in Syria, which was um, destroyed, blown up by IS, um, in which people were able to photogrammatize um, and reconstruct. And so there is this idea of preserving, you know, humanitarian memory, right? The memory of our species, of things that we consider to be important. Um, when they had a light show at the Bamayan Buddha site in Afghanistan that was blown up by the Taliban, I think that's, that the whole world paid attention to that because everyone was really sad when those were blown up. So, good question. Thanks. In addition to, you know, preservation and studying, by digitizing objects, you can now do reprehensible things like break them open or cut into them and look and see how the structure of the object uh, is formed. Now that of course is dependent on what sort of digitization that you're doing. But once you have that data, that virtual object is, is fully accessible and manipulatable so that you can study it in a variety of ways that you would never be able to study the actual object. Uh, so the digitization opens up a, a, a whole cornucopia of opportunities for learning about objects in addition to preserving them and sharing them, if sharing is what you want to do. Is there another question here in the room? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the questions are uh, about the Matterport system uh, that we have. A variety of questions here, so we'll try to go through those. Um, uh, first off, was you know, does it gen? What does it generate? What is actually created by the Matterport? And it's a it's a collection of geometry. It's a, it doesn't generate a full point cloud, but close enough to being a point cloud. Uh, and then a geometric mesh is derived from that point cloud. And because it is also an optical camera, it generates photographic textures and a, a texture map for that. So after uh, the, the Matterport scan is completed, you do have a mesh geometry plus texture. And that data can be downloaded for an extra fee uh, from the service. And, and in that, you've got your geometry. The, uh, it's a, uh, is it an STL file or a POI? I, it's an OBJ, thank you. Uh, an OBJ file plus your textures, uh, the texture map, as well as a point cloud. So there, there is a point cloud somewhere in that workflow, but it's a, it's a commercial service, so we, they don't always reveal to us everything about how it works. Uh, but you do get geometry plus texture, which is really nice. And then that can be scaled appropriately and then brought into VR environments where you can really fully explore the space. Uh, we've done some experimenting with that with some pretty good success. Um, the accuracy of the geometry is not bad. It's less than an inch, but it's not much less than an inch of, of imprecision right there. Uh, there is an option through the Matterport system to use an actual LIDAR system, which would give you about millimeter accuracy. So when you do need uh, that level of detail, the LiDAR system works out pretty well, but its optical camera is inferior. So you still get texture, but it's um, it leaves a little to be desired. Uh, so we may be able to experiment using LiDAR capture as well as the Pro 2 camera capture for a project coming up later this year that we're still developing. Um, what was the second part of the question? People, you can capture people if they're really good at holding still. Because, so each capture that, that Matt hinted at, actually, can you tab us over to the Hoagie Carmichael room? So, um, and can you press the number two on the keyboard? Okay, so here's our dollhouse right here. And those little blue dots that you saw on the ground, like I just clicked into one, each one of these dots, I guess they're blue when you're focused on them, but they're gray otherwise, that is a position where the camera was placed in order to 
do a capture a scan. So there's a one scan at each of these little rings right here. A scan takes about 30 to 45 seconds for the camera because the camera on the tripod slews around in 60 degree increments and it's got three arrays of three cameras. So there's nine cameras on the chassis right there that are all taking pictures uh, after each slew to the new position right there. So a little bit under a minute per capture. A site uh, could have as few as you know, maybe 15 scans and up to, we've been told there's an upper bound of around 200, but that has to do with just processing time and a couple other things. So it's, it's kind of fuzzy. Uh, when we do the Lily uh, library capture, we're gonna probably play with that upper bound right there because there's so much detail that we wanna capture. So in a room the size of the Hoagie Carmichael room, Matthew, do you remember about how long it took you? About 20 minutes to capture this one room. Could you press number two again, please? Actually, yeah, press two. So we're, we're using the, uh, so then here, yeah, here's the dollhouse view right here. Now we, we can also do, if you press number three on the keyboard, here's the floor plan view. So it gives you an orthogonal projection of the floor plan. It's using, uh, to, to display the geometry and the textures, it's using a concept called back face culling. So that's why, you know, we can see through objects if you're behind it like that, so that's why we don't see the ceiling right here. Um, so this room, which is, oh gosh, I don't know, 800 square feet, I don't know how many square feet. It's a decent sized room, only took you about 20 minutes to capture it. Now, if you have a series of rooms or uh, multiple smaller rooms in a larger structure, then that will take longer uh, time to capture that. We've done that with uh, a couple other locations that took upwards of about two hours. Uh, to capture those. Um, we did the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies up at IPUI, and there's a lot of complexity in there. They've got bookcases that you have to go up and down each row, and, and there's a lot of objects in that space. So it took about two hours to scan that one. And then you had a third part of that question, the acquisition, the geometry, people, people got to hold real still. Because yeah, for each scan, uh, the fee. Okay, so uh, the Advanced Visualization Lab in CyberDH, we have uh, a, an account with that. So depending on the nature of a project, there may not be a fee um, because, you know, we've, we've got this uh, sort of, it's covered under subscription. However, if there's a really big, bold project that might take more resources than average, we might have to figure out some way to help cover that sort of cost. But generally for some of these spaces, you know, preserving the Hoagie, or digitizing, I should say, the Hoagie Carmichael room as it was on that date, um, there, there was no chargeback or anything like that. Uh, we do have some limits about the number of spaces that can be hosted at any given time. So there is there are resources that are consumed, but this is for the university. So we try to work well with that. We have a comment on that. Uh, yeah, I was noticing that the dollhouse view and the tour looks different from each other. Um, can you explain why that is? Can you explain to me what you mean by different? Yeah, so you're going around a circle right here. You're, you're, you seem to be going around um, a sequence of, of photographs, whereas the, the other It, um, the Matterport is really good. So, so the question was about the distinction or the different look of the dollhouse view versus when you are inside the scan. And it's the same data. It's the same data. Now, now the camera can capture this spherical data, the geometry and texture, but it can also do a photosphere as an additional pass. And the photospheres can, can be shared or exported out to maybe make into a, a, a photosphere tour like the limestone tour was. But maybe the differences that you're seeing here are the fact that uh, the, the geometry and the details here are downsampled a bit to show you the full dollhouse. Are those models right there? Yes, this is a model. This is a mesh. Uh, uh, that, that we're viewing in a viewer, similar to the way Sketchfab, which we used to show the uh, the shipwreck and what was the other object in the Sketchfab? And the chapel, thank you, uh, from earlier on. Similar sort of viewing technique where uh, the, the geometry and 
the geometry has the texture projected onto it and that's loaded into a viewer that runs in the web browser. But here we're zoomed way back out. So it's downsampling stuff. So like the piano doesn't look nearly as good out here as it does when we click into it, but it's the same data right there. So good question there. Well, the dollhouse, the dollhouse that we mentioned is the way that it is, uh, that the data is viewed. If you purchase, because it is an extra purchase to get the geometry and texture download, that's called a matter pack. And, and, and that additional purchase would then allow you to load the OBJ file, the textures and, and whatnot into a, a software that is capable of rendering and displaying that technology for you. And that's something that the AVL and CyberDH are also exploring. So Tassie's bringing up on screen right now, something really cool, here you go. So I feel like um, Chris was using a lot of terms, which if you're not entirely familiar with them, texture, mesh, um, you know, MTL. So, um, so here, this is the Hoagie Carmichael without the texture, um, which it takes a while. So basically, if you think of the color as the texture, this is, this is how the model is made. And actually, when it's being calculated, you can think of every point here. It makes a, it makes a dense point cloud and then connects all the points so that you have all these polygons um, that make the shape. So that's why it won't ever be an exact model, right? Because this is just triangles approximating the shape of the statue that's out there. But if you remember your calculus, the more triangles there are, the more it approaches the exact nature of the, the, the statue. So, and then when you turn I wonder if it'll let me. Yeah, it will. Um, so then you can also look at it where I still haven't applied the, the texture, but what I've done is I'm now showing you the matcap version, which is the model as it sort of, you can now see sort of, are there things that we captured? I don't know. I think I zoomed in. Oh, it's over here. I wonder if there's a way to, yeah, there we go. There go. Okay. And then, yeah, you can bring it up here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here, you now you can see, um, for us at least, actually we did have some, um, some trouble in capturing like the piano exactly. Now you actually see some of the imperfections with the model um, that you might miss if you're just looking at it when it's texture wrapped. So it's actually really important to look at all of these things together and then take into account some of what Matt was talking about. Who's your audience? So I don't think we will have very many people who are, um, Hoagie Carmichaelis, if you think of like paleobotanists, <laughs> who are coming in and saying, oh my goodness, this is not an exact replica of this piano and therefore I can't study it. So in general, that's not what this model will be used for. However, um, if you're looking at fossils and coral and things like that that are being preserved, they often use different types of 3D capture um, because their accuracy is the, of paramount importance. Um, if you look at coral on Sketchfab, um, you can actually, this is another thing where you can track change over time, but people are using more, um, more precise methods of capture because again, you want to be sure that when you go back the next year and you see dieback that you're getting an accurate representation of that. Okay, we'll check online. Are there any questions from any of our remote viewers or they've understood everything and they'll be ready for the quiz next week? Nope, we have another question inside. Okay, so the question was about the last bullet point here that the, the full tour and a lot of this data will be presented at the Bicentennial Showcase and other locations that we might be able to tease you about. Yes, so, um, so the Hoagie Carmichael folks will be at the Bicentennial Showcase, which is from 10 to noon, Friday, September 27th, um, in the solarium um, of the IMU. Uh, we will be presenting some other 3D experiences there um, if you want to come by, so it won't just be us, it'll be... Us, MDPI, um, the people from the water survey will be talking about their mega Jeff. Um, I know that, I'm trying to think who else I know for sure is going to be there. Um, but I think there are about 12 different archival collections on campus that will be represented. And 
our big project from the summer, the bicentennial bus, should be parked outside. I know. So we're really excited about that. You can actually see the Ray Bradbury um, Center, which Chris was alluding to, um, in a VR headset. Um, should you come to that, you can see some 3D prints um, involving bronze, um, which is pretty cool. Um, you can see the old ye oldy oaken buckety um, and <laughs> the mega Jeff toe. Um, and then there are also a whole bunch of interactive touchscreens. And then on that bus um, includes some actual um, things from archives, such as the earrings that Glenn Close wore in Fatal Attraction the actual earrings. So um, there should be something for everyone. Um, so like I said, and I think next Friday is, is sort of the first of many outings for the bus. Is there anything else coming up in the near future? Um, so I did, Chris, did you get to talk about Cobb? So there's a, there's a large uh, multi-institution working group uh, that we refer to as the CAV, C-A-A-V. That's the Campus Alliance for Advanced Visualization. And uh, it moves around from year to year, or from meeting to meeting, I should say. And this year, we are hosting it here at Indiana University. Um, it will be next month, October 15th, 17th, here in Bloomington. It's the fourth international conference. This is great. I can read slides. I love it. So we'll be talking about uh, a lot of, ah, oh, what'd you do? No, I don't know. I'll figure something out. Something happened inside it's and it's back. Um, gremlins. So uh, these is an activity that we fully support and the AVL is, is hosting uh, a lot of interesting things going on here with the COV. Um, I don't know if we'll be streaming any aspects of it. I guess the COV website, thecov.squarespace.com, as well as rt.iu.edu slash thecov19. So those are there on the slide. Yep, yep. So we're going to be showcasing some of the work that we've been doing here in advanced visualization. And our last slide here is... If you have uh, further questions, comments, anything like that, if you want to contact the Advanced Visualization Lab, our email is vizhelp, V-I-S-H-E-L-P, at iu.edu. Uh, Cyber Infrastructure for Digital Humanities also has an email address, cy cyberdh at iu.edu. Excellent. And just for fun, as a reminder, we will do this, and here are the other upcoming events in this series, just to go back and revisit this slide right here. So do we have any other questions? We might go into discussion because the lucky duckies in the room often get to hang out and chit chat for that sort of thing. Anything uh, from the online chat? We're checking online. Oh, we have another question, yes. So there's a question about the chapel capture. I'm going to hand it back to Tassie. Um, I have to double check with uh, the person who did it. Um, I know that he had a telephoto lens, but I think they actually got him on scaffolding to capture some of the higher stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, he basically went across at one height, and then he got to go across at higher than you and I would normally be at um, to capture it. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so, which was super cool. Um, so, I can go into the pics and look. I think that he is a Canon person, so like a Canon DSLR camera, um, one of the fancy ones. Um, Not a special device like the Matterport? Nope, so that's the thing about photogrammetry and why we talk about it a lot as a, a great way to get into this is that I started photogrammetry with um, a $400 DSLR camera and made some pretty okay models. Um, we now use a 3000 DSLR camera, but um, when you think about that in comparison to some of these 360 rigs that are dedicated for one thing only, um, that's actually not a terrible price to pay. Um, yeah, but if you look at, so if you, this chapel, the, the gentleman who did it is now on a fellowship year. He got the prestigious Rome Fellowship, so he's in Rome for the whole year um, based on some of this kind of work that he does. OK. 
Okay, thanks everybody.